Hi, Craig. Hey, Craig. Hello, Craig. And hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. We're going to be talking about Suzuka today, our Grand Prix for the weekend, and we're going to be covering a little history, last year's race, and of course, this weekend's predictions. On the episode, we have Ito, Amy, and myself, Chelsea, and I'm going to be passing it off to Ito, who has that background on the racetrack's history. The Japanese Formula One Grand Prix has a rich history dating back to its inaugural race in 1976 at the Fuji Speedway. The circuit located at the base of Mount Fuji provided a breathtaking backdrop for the race in its early years. And because the Japanese Grand Prix was often one of the final races of the season, it was a crucial event in determining the World Drivers' Champion as well as Constructor Champions. The 1976 season, in particular, was notable for its dramatic showdown between James Hunt and Nicky Lauda, a battle that was later immortalized in the film Rush. And while Nicky Lauda did say that the movie is about 80% accurate, in my book, it's still a must-see. The current circuit is 5.807 kilometer long, aka 3.608 miles. Zuka International Racing Course became the permanent home of the Japanese Grand Prix in 1987. And its challenging 53 laps long figure eight layout is beloved and hated by drivers and fans alike. The race at Suzuka has witnessed numerous iconic moments in Formula One history, including infamous collisions between Ayrton Senna and Alan Prost in the late 80s and early 90s. These clashes played a pivotal role in shaping the championship battles of those years. However, it was also the site of tragic events like the crash of Jules Bianchi in 2014, which would put him in a coma that he would sadly never wake up from again. Over the years, though, the Japanese Grand Prix has consistently featured thrilling races and has been essential in the Formula One calendar, especially in recent years due to the rather unpredictable Japanese weather this time of year. An example of this was 2019 when FB3 on Saturday was canceled and qualifying was held on Sunday morning all due to Typhoon Hagibis. This free Saturday led to some drivers congregating in Max Verstappen's room to play FIFA or others used the extra day to study the data gathered in Friday's free practice sessions. And as mentioned before, due to its rather late um, place in the calendar, it has seen drivers like Michael Schumacher, Lewis Hamilton, and most recently Max Verstappen all clench their world title at this challenging circuit. And I wanted to take this time to highlight some of the records around the circuit. And as I mentioned, it is a world championship crowning circuit. So it is no surprise that there were 12 occasions where a world champion has been crowned at Suzuka, including in five consecutive seasons between 1987 and 1991. And beyond being crowned world champion at Suzuka, Michael Schumacher is also the most successful driver at Suzuka, having a record six victories between 1995 and 2004. Hot on his heels is Lewis Hamilton, who recorded his fifth Japanese Grand Prix victory in 2019. While Lewis has five victories at the Japanese Grand Prix, at Suzuka he has four, because one of these races that he's won in Japan has been held at Fuji. So that record is kind of with an asterisk attached to it. Now on a team level, 
we have also seen a fair few constructor crowns handed out in Japan, nine to be exact. With 2019 being the most recent one where Mercedes won it all. Now, while we could talk about Suzuka's history all episode, to be honest, we really want to go back and look at last year's race, starting with last year's practice. Now, with just under 10 minutes to go until the start of FP1 at Suzuka, it was raining hard. It was beyond wet, and thankfully the session wasn't delayed. There were actually questions going around the teams of the session going to be delayed, and thankfully it wasn't. And ironically enough, Kevin Magnuson was the first to go out on track and brave the conditions in his Haas, followed by local hero Yuki Sonoda. And I have to say, the crowd was so fantastic for Yuki. Seeing all of the support was just really heartwarming. And at one point, Yuki actually came on team radio to talk about the rain and said there are a couple rivers in sector one if that gives you an idea of just how bad the rain was tifi was the next driver to head out on track before deciding that one exploratory lap was enough for him after close to 15 minutes through the one hour session only three drivers came out on the track and each driver came back into the pits after a singular lap Lance Stroll was also somebody who had a turn on the track, but he actually was quoted as saying that the track was dry and there wasn't a lot of standing water, which was kind of interesting because it really didn't look like the rain was going to ease up at that point. With half of the session gone, we saw the Ferraris with a 1-2 with Carlos ahead of Charles. And with about five minutes to go in the session, we saw umbrellas starting to go up in the crowd and all of the drivers enter the pits. Not long after, though, we did surprisingly see both of the Alfa Romeo boys head out on track. It really just kind of looked like they wanted to have a look at the track conditions. And Joe pointed out that there was a massive increase in standing water, which was honestly pretty obvious at that point. And towards the end of the session, we saw Mick Schumacher go off, spinning out at the Dunlop curve and colliding with the barriers on the inside. Now, your top three... For FP1 were as follows, Fernando Alonso in P1, Carlos Sainz in P2, and Charles Leclerc in P3. And our bottom five were Pierre Gasly in P16, Nicholas Latifi in P17, George Russell in P18, Yuki Sonoda in P19, and Sebastian Vettel in P20. Now, FP2 was originally supposed to be extended from a 60-minute session to a 90-minute session to allow teams to test Pirelli's 2023 tires. However, due to the wet conditions at Suzuka, the planned testing was completely scrapped because the testing was supposed to be for dry tires. And obviously, you can't test dry tires when it's wet. So the session did still run for an hour and a half as had originally been scheduled. Sadly, Mick Schumacher was not able to participate in FP2 after the shunt at the end of FP1. Teams said it was due to a chassis change that was required. When FP2 kicked off, we saw Nicholas Latifi be the first driver to brave the track conditions, which ended up being very similar to FP1. One of my favorite moments during P2 was Lando and his race engineer, and it went a little bit like this. How's the track, Lando? Wet. It felt really on brand for Lando. He's also the same person who, when asked what damage he had, he said he had talent at one point. So, just Lando being Lando. And honestly, if I'm going to talk about moments, I have to mention the moment of massive confusion in the pits for Yuki Tsunoda when AlphaTauri left him in the box for a bit without even working on the car. It really just kind of looked like they mixed up the tires between wet and intermediates. It was a bit of a hot mess. Our top three for FP2 was George Russell in P1, Lewis Hamilton in P2, and Max Verstappen in P3. Bottom five were as follows. Lando in P16, Daniel in P17, Lance in P18, Pierre in P19, and Mick in P20 with no set times. Now, FP3 was a little interesting. FP3 P3 started off with a little silly season drama when we found out at around 10 a.m. that Pierre Gasly was going to be replacing Fernando Alonso at Alpine for 2023, and Nick DeVries would be replacing Pierre at AlphaTauri. After all the rain in FP1 and FP2, we finally had a dry track, though there were some clouds and some wind, but 
Weather was good and the crowd was even bigger than we'd seen before. George was the first one to come out on track and kick off FP3 and we saw a good mix of tire compounds being used. It really was mainly softs and mediums for at least the opening stages. Fernando Alonso was one who went out on hard tires and he actually had a little bit of a moment at the last corner of the track. It really just kind of looked like the temperature was a bit too cold for some hard tires, but it was an ex that's kind of what practice is for, is to try out, test out your tires, see what's going to work and what's not going to work. With 15 minutes into the session, we saw Max topping the timesheets on his soft tires, and he was actually 1.1 seconds ahead of his teammate Checo. The fastest man on mediums was actually none other than local Yuki Tsunoda, who was 2.9 seconds behind Max. And as I mentioned, it was windy, and quite a few different di drivers were complaining about the wind. Nicholas Latifi came on and said, the wind sensitivity is now the highest I've seen all season. And as I said, he wasn't really the only one to complain about the conditions for that day. Lewis even told the team that the wind gusts looked like they were aligning with some of the snaps that they were having with the car. Now, your top three were as follows. We had Max in P1, Carlos in P2, and Charles in P3. And your bottom five were Mick in P16, Yuki in P17, Joe in P18, Nicholas Latifi in P19, and Pierre rounding us out in P20. And as I said, despite the rain during FP1 and FP2 and the windy conditions we had in FP3, it is worth noting that we didn't see a single red flag across any of the three practice sessions. The, and the only driver we saw that had a major moment was Mick at the end of FP1, which really isn't that bad for a free practice sessions. Now, jumping from FP3 to Quali, Max was holding that lead he just got. And he was able to lead the qualies. So by the end of Q1, no one had even been able to catch up to him. And behind him was Carlos and Leclerc. And they were pulling P2 and P3, which left Alex, Pierre, Kevin, Lance, and Latifi eliminated right there in Q1. Q2 was a little harder on our drivers because the sun was starting to go down. So they were just facing some issues of the car slowing down because of like the sun being in their eyes. And even Carlos, he called into like his engineer and he was like, sun's going down, cars are slowing down, like giving an update. And I think this did end up affecting them because even though we saw Checo finish in P1 and Alonso in P2 and Max in P3, Carlos and Charles both slowed down to like P6 and P7, I think. And we had Danny get lost out of there Valtteri was out of there, Yuki was out of there, Joe was out of there, and Mick. And I think what upset me the most when you're like watching this is Danny got left behind by only 0 0.003 seconds right there. And that sucks because cool on Latifi, I think it was his rookie year when this was happening. So technically that was a good thing for him. But we saw Danny get kicked out of Q2. Now, the last quarter left us with a pretty exciting top 10 ready to take pole position. We saw Ocon try, like he led for a bit, but then the Ferraris took the lead and they were like 1-2 on it. And I honestly, for just one second, was like, yes, it's a Ferrari moment. It wasn't because then Max took the lead, which is what he's been doing all this season. And that's how the race finished. So we saw Max taking pole position. Charles actually did pretty well. He got P2 and Carlos rounded up the P3. So like, you know, it wasn't bad for us. But I am going to say the rest of the top 10 was interesting because we had Perez in fourth. Ocon got pushed down to fifth after being able to lead. Lewis was behind him. Then Alonso. Then George. Sebastian Beto in ninth. And Lando finished us off in 10. And... After a crazy quality like that with a very nice variety in their top 10, we pushed it off to race day. Yeah, so let's talk about it. Race day. As we know by now, Max secured victory and therefore clenched the 2022 world title after a late penalty for Charles Leclerc ended his chances of getting it himself. Honestly, in retrospect, it seems like a given, especially when you look at how Max is dominating this season, 
However, it was rather hilarious how he got told at that moment, and especially as no one, least of all Max, was sure whether the information they were getting about him being WDC was accurate. And honestly, that awkward cooldown room is definitely something to rewatch it or watch for the first time if you haven't. Especially the rather awkward walk of Max to the, shall I say, throne that they had in the next room. But let's back up a bit and talk about how we got to it. The race started with heavy rain and because Max was defending from pole against Leclerc, it honestly was an interesting start, but it only lasted for two laps, sadly. Then the race was red flagged due to intense spray and several incidents, including Carlos Sainz crashing. There go our Ferrari hopes and dreams. A lengthy delay followed with mechanics playing Uno, for example, or driver taking naps. And officials, honestly, during that delay, just waited for suitable weather gaps to restart the race. After nearly 50 minutes, a rolling start behind a safety car took place with all cars on wet tires. Verstappen managed to change to intermediates skillfully, which allowed him to extend his lead. And while Charles was poised to finish second, he received that damned penalty that will cost him his WDC chances for cutting the final chicane on the last lap while defending against Perez. Esteban Ocon finished in, in fourth after defending against Lewis, while Sebastian Vettel recovered from an early clash with Fernando Alonso to finish sixth. Alonso finished seventh, following by George Russell, Nicholas Latifi, and Lando Norris. Daniel Ricciardo, sadly, once again, missed out on points in 11th place, with Lance Stroll, Yuki Tsunoda, and Kevin Magnussen following. Valtteri Bottas and Pierre Gasly finished in 15th and 17th, respectively. And I feel like I keep saying this, but even this race again, due to the weather conditions, made for a very chaotic race throughout, with various tire strategies, but all capped by Verstappen's win in front of Honda's home crowd, which, it being Honda's home crowd, was made extra special as Honda is the engine supplier of Red Bull until the end of 25. And because of this, Max can be quoted saying the following in an interview after the race. I'm just very happy that we got to race at the end. It was raining quite happily and was just really tough for us to drive. But luckily, we got quite an amount of laps in and the car was flying in the inter conditions as well. I'm very pleased to win here, but also very happy to see all the fans and that they have stuck around. And as far as his title goes, he says, as for the title, what can I say? Incredible, of course. It's very special to do it here in front of all the Honda people, all the Japanese fans. And honestly, I commend him for saying this because who doesn't love a humble winner? But enough about last year. Let's talk about this year and our predictions for it. So as usual, with my predictions, it's magic dice time. So let's go. P1, Esteban Ocon. Another Essi Besties on the podium, baby? Especially on the top step this time? Yes, please. P2, Zhou Guanyu. I mean, he would definitely deserve it, especially after signing with Alpha for another year last week. P3, Nico Hulkenberg. All I'm going to say is, will the podium curse be finally broken? Question mark. Huge question mark on that one. As for the others in the top 10, we have P4, Charles Leclerc. P5, Logan Sargent. P6, Liam Lawson. P7, Valtteri Bottas. 
P8, Fernando Alonso, P9, George Russell, and P10, Oscar Piastri. Honestly, seeing these results, the first thing that comes to mind is all the rookies get points at this rather tricky circuit. Good for them. Especially Logan, as he doesn't have any yet. Sometimes I wonder if I can throw out a crazy prediction and, you know, if it might just stick. But sadly, I'm a little too practical and realistic, so I'll just give you what I actually think is going to happen this weekend for the top three. Now, first place, I am going to give it to Max, only because after losing in Singapore, I wouldn't be surprised if he keeps that little promise he said where he's like, he's going to make a 20-second gap at Suzuka this weekend for the final win. And the only worry I have with him saying this is that we've seen that so many times where drivers just accidentally jinx themselves, like Alonso this season, where he said, you're never going to see Aston Martin not on the podium again. Baby, where have you been? I've never seen you on the podium again, you know? So I just want that to be kept in mind when drivers like this do that. I think sometimes they jinx themselves. Maybe they put too much pressure on themselves, and that's what makes them do a little mistake here and there. But it's Max, and he has proven us wrong so many damn times that I'm like, you know what? He's in a Red Bull. Well, he's probably, he'll see. We'll see. He's fine. So that's my number one. Second, I'm giving it to Charles and Ferrari. Now, Carlos already had his time this past weekend, and he shined amazing, beautiful. It was absolutely great to watch. But I think Charles has a better chance on this circuit to get on the podium. And I'm really hoping the Ferrari win last week can give him a little push in helping Charles get his podium this week. And in third, I'm giving it to George. After last week's loss, I really think he's just looking for a redemption race, and I hope that doesn't put too much pressure on himself where he makes mistakes, and instead it pushes him to get on a podium finish, because while I don't think he will get P1 if Max is really aiming for a 20 second gap, I do think he could get on the podium just fine. I'm not sure about the rest, I definitely see like maybe Ocon in the points, McLaren, I see K-Mag doing fine. Hopefully it doesn't rain too much this year. And definitely Alex. And obviously I'm going to hope for Yuki. So speaking of the weather, I am really hoping for a dry race this weekend. I actually checked the weather and so far it's looking like there's a very slim chance of rain. But I feel like things change so fast there weather-wise that... That could change. I mean, we're recording this on Wednesday. That could change come Friday or it could change come Thursday. We'll find out. Now, if you've listened to us for a while, you have learned that I tend to pull out my pendulum to do my predictions. And I decided when I did my predictions this week that I was going to use a new pendulum just to spice things up a little bit. Because why not? So here's how it broke down for me. I have Fernando Alonso in P1. And I, for one, won't complain about seeing a Nando podium. I really want an old school Fernando Selly because it's just been a really long time since we've seen one. And this, for me, honestly, might be one of the more realistic predictions that my pendulum has given me so far. Now, P2, we have Max Verstappen, and I will frickin' take it. Obviously, as the Red Bull girl of the group, and you really can't blame me. I've been a Red Bull fan since 2012. And that is just never going to change at this point in my life. I would love that. After last weekend's race, I definitely see Max going full Mad Max to make sure he does not have a repeat of last weekend. And I can really also see the team bending over backwards to ensure that that car is ready to go and deliver. Again, it's another realistic prediction for my pendulum, and maybe using a new pendulum was the right move for me, after all. P3 is where things got a little interesting for me. And that is Nico Hulkenberg. It looks like my pendulum agrees with Ito's dice. Now, you know, most people know, especially the PGP girls, I'm not the biggest Nico fan. Even I would love to see him break his no podium curse. I just think it would be fun. Is it realistic? I'm not so sure about that one. Now for the best of the rest, here's how it shook out. Before we have Carlos Sainz. 
P5, Lando Norris, a little Carlando action, and I'd love to see it. Six, Liam Lawson. I honestly would lose my mind if this actually happens. Got points last weekend, and I would just love to see him kind of keep on a roll, just really cement an opportunity for him to get a seat in F1 next year. P7, we have Oscar Piastri. A Esty Bestie Esteban Ocon, who just released a new merch line. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's fan freaking tastic. Want it all, but my wallet can't handle it. P9, we have Pierre Gasly, and P10, Logan Sargent. We all keep saying this. We've said this a hundred times, and I think we're all still going to keep saying it until it actually happens. And that is seeing Logan get some points. I really want it to happen. Is it actually going to happen? I don't know. But I am going to do all the manifesting I can to make it happen or at least get him close enough. I don't know. Maybe it'll happen in Coda, but I would love to see it happen this weekend. Yeah. I mean, it definitely looks like my dice and Amy's pendulum do agree because we agree on Nico and Logan. But enough with our predictions. We also wanted to bring you guys some headlines and discuss those. So, while silly season hasn't really been sillying, I want to say, we did get some potential updates. So, let's go. So, there is a rumored contract extension for Yuki coming this week, which, I mean, it's Japan. It would be ideal. But what does that mean for Liam and Danny? Well, rumor has it, again that Danny's announcement will follow later. Maybe Coda, who knows? But then again, Liam has been performing, so will that change? Who knows? So I've actually seen some rumors that Liam is potentially going to Williams, which would be really interesting. I'm not sure if he is willing to leave the Red Bull family, so I don't really know how that would work. Because Liam has been involved in their junior program and is avidly like a Red Bull guy. I just don't know how that works if he switches over to Williams. I'm not sure he's 120% ready to cut ties to Red Bull. So I could see him, if Alpha Tauri signs Danny again, signing to be the Red Bull Alpha Tauri like reserve development driver and basically fill in for what Danny was kind of supposed to be doing. So far, it sounds like. It's either reserve with Red Bull and Alpha Tauri or Williams, potentially. I don't hate either option. I mean, I'd really love to see him in a full-time seat, but I'll take a reserve spot if it keeps him in the Red Bull family. Yeah, and speaking of reserve drivers, Mick Schumacher, who's currently reserve for Mercedes. While there have been some rumors floating that... He was on Williams' radar. Apparently, it has come out that's not actually the case, at least not for 2024. However, it is rumored that he will drive for WEC with Alpine on top of his current Mercedes responsibilities for 2024. I could be wrong, but wasn't there rumors that they were going to re-sign Logan anyways for next year? And keep him with Alex. It's a rumor. No one no one, quote me on that. So I have seen the same rumor. And it does make sense in my brain. I think it's probably going to have to do with how his performance is. Next few races. And also, like, until Danny is back in the car. I bet you money that Williams is at minimum keeping an eye on Liam. Because why wouldn't they? He's a rookie. He's Doing really well in a real one car, which he's never driven before. So it is still rumor, but I also totally understand if Williams decides to sign Logan for another year and give him another chance just to kind of see. I personally l- would love to see Mick do the World Endurance Championship next year. I think it would be a really good challenge for him. I know from what we've seen on his social media, he does like to do other types and styles of racing. So it would give him a really good challenge. It would keep him, I think, a little bit more active. 
than just being a reserve. I also am just a massive Weck fan. I think it's so much fun to watch. So, I don't know. It's I say he should do it, but that's kind of up to him. Yeah. And on the note of, dare I say, Red Bull musical chairs, we also have another potential title sponsor for AlphaTauri because, as we know, AlphaTauri, the brand, will leave F1. So there have been a few names thrown around, especially closing brands. And most recently, it has been Adidas as a title sponsor. Because remember, during summer break, it was Hugo Boss. I mean, don't get me wrong, I like both brands. Both brands are German, but very different vibes at the same time. So I am very intrigued by the idea of Adidas because we've already got Puma as a sponsor for certain teams. So it'd be kind of cool to have another footwear brand involved. From a branding perspective, I also really like the idea a little bit better because the names that were thrown around with Hugo Boss of like Hugo Boss Bulls Racing, just I hate it. I absolutely hate it. It makes me want to cry. I feel like Adidas would be a little bit more go with the flow and probably be less willing to have their name be like a title sponsor, kind of like how it's MoneyGram Haas. I don't really see them being like, oh yeah, we want to be Adidas, whatever, whatever, and maybe more leaning in towards the Italian roots of the team. Not necessarily going back to Toro Rosso, but something kind of in that realm. I'm interested to see who they honestly go with in the long run, though. For me, the whole Adidas and Puma potential would be hilarious because if you guys didn't know, the founder of Adidas and the founder of Puma were brothers. So they started Adidas together because Adidas stands for Adi Dussler the founder's name, but then they had a falling out and the non-Adi brother went off and founded Puma. So that would be kind of hilarious in my mind. I love that. I did not know that. I, we love a fun fact on this podcast and that just made my evening so much better that I, I do love the little bit of sibling rivalry that could almost lend itself to from a narrative. Again, I'm the girl who works in branding and marketing, so that's where my head automatically goes. I, oh, that would be so much fun. I'm not going to lie. I'm partial to Puma because my company works with them. But I like the idea of Adidas entering before Nike. Only because Nike has their hands in so many things, it's kind of nice to see Adidas be like, hey, I'm going to one-up you real quick because I'm going to jump here while America's still getting into it. If we want to stick with a shoe brand, I'd honestly love to see like New Balance. I know that sounds really silly. I'm also like a Massachusetts girl and New Balance is local to me. So I like I drive past their headquarters on a daily basis. Anytime I go into downtown Boston, you, it, it looks like a cruise ship. It's hilarious. If you're local, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I, I think a shoe brand would be fun. I would love a title sponsor for a team that doesn't have product is ridiculously expensive i want to be able to buy team branded merch somewhere that's not going to cost me an arm and a leg like i just think it'd be cool now while we could talk about sponsor options all day i really want to see if there's anybody else who's had a new contract come through i think my favorite new contract is oscar for mclaren because i'm sorry but mclaren maybe i'm a bandwagon but i love you guys i love you and I'm not going to lie, I'm really happy to see that Oscar got re-signed, mostly because one, I think he's an amazing driver to start with, but two, I love his personality. And seeing him on Twitter, if you guys don't follow him, just check it out because he's so sassy. He's like a sassy kid. And the first thing he put on Twitter was like, oh, nice smooth contract sign. Like, I'm so done with you. And if you don't know... There's a little history with him and Alpine and McLaren. I recommend looking it up if you want to see that drama. Yes, I'm very happy that Oscar did not have another Piasco scenario because that was just, at once was enough. 
And as Chels mentioned, Oscar is honestly really sassy on Twitter. Maybe it's because he's young. I don't really know. But if you do not follow him on Twitter, and yes, I refuse to call it X, I absolutely recommend it because it's it's iconic. I also, like 10 out of 10 recommend that you follow his lovely mother. I know it sounds really funny. I'm suggesting you follow a driver's mom. His mom, Nicole, is so awesome. It's very obvious that Oscar's personality comes from his mom because she put out a tweet after the announcement came out that said, what? We're doing this for another three years? And it's just so awesome. I think it's safe to say that Nicole is the definition of a cool F1 mom. I love it. She's also posted some funny things when he was on a motorcycle freaking out about saying, I have a hard enough time drive watching you drive something with four wheels. I'm not even going to think about two. She's just a very honest mom, and I love it. I love that she tweeted that. As when I saw the news this morning, my first thought was, I hope Nicole Piastri tweets about this. Because her tweets, they're not gold, they're platinum. Now, well, I'm sure we could all rave about how amazing Nicole Piastri is. I want to talk about one of my personal favorite things that happens on a race weekend. That is specialty helmets. If you've listened to us for a while, you know that specialty lids are like my favorite thing to talk about. Now, Fernando Alonso came in with what I think is one of my all-time favorite lids from him to date. Like, this man has been racing for years. He's done a lot of helmets. I think this is like my top tier favorite. He's playing homage to the Japanese culture and heritage with a special helmet dedicated to the land of the rising sun. Fun fact, he also has a tattoo of of the same samurai that's on his helmet. It goes down his back. And the design of the tattoo is reportedly influenced by the Hagakuri, a spiritual guide penned by Yamamoto Tsutomo, a revered 18th century samurai. And this helmet is gorgeous. It's very simple. It's mainly black and white with a red circle like the Japanese flag. It's just beautiful. It really does pay homage to the country and the culture, and it fits him really well. I'm going to have to agree with you, Amy, on this one. His helmet is gorgeous. However, we have some more helmets to talk through. And in true Essie Bestie fashion, I came across his special helmet, for this weekend from his TikTok. And honestly, the helmet is good, but the TikTok, out of this world. We can always count on SD Bestie to give us fantastic TikTok content. It's, it's so good. Oh, I love his TikTok account. It makes my soul happy. Max also came out with a new lid for the weekend. And he talked about how his has special memories of Japan. I drove my first Formula One practice session at Suzuka back in the day, which was quite challenging. And since then, I've always held a special relationship with the country, especially with Honda coming on board with our team. Then, of course, I managed to win my second world championship in Japan last year. Now, when he was talking about the design of the helmet, he was quoted as saying, Pan brings back a lot of special memories for me, and that's why I thought this was a good place to have a special helmet. White with a red circle represents the Japanese flag. This helmet also has a different logo on the front, with EA Sports FC on the front as they're launching their new football game. You can find a full video on YouTube and his Instagram account if you want to see the helmet in all directions. It's really pretty. I do suggest that you keep an eye on our Twitter account because I'm going to put up a poll so you can pick your favorites because I said I love a specialty helmet. Now, I don't know if anybody else saw this on social media today, but as we all love Sebastian Vettel on this podcast, he is setting up beehives behind turn two at Suzuka. You know, it sounds insane. It's part of a biodiversity project, and if you're looking at the track during practice, quality, the race, you'll notice that the curves at turn two have been painted black and yellow instead of their usual black and white. I think white and red on some other curbs. And so he's actually going to be building 11 hives with the help of a local Japanese carpenter. And it's just so on brand with Sebastian Vettel. I mean, this is the same man who created a t-shirt that said save the bees on the front of it. 
do you really wish I got that shirt? But it's just, it's Seb. He wants to help the universe and the world and the planet. And it's just, it's so on brand. And I love him for it. And I'm just going to close us off before we go into pre-outro with my favorite helmet of the week. And that's going to go out to Lewis Hamilton. Now, if you guys haven't seen it, he posted it today. Today's Wednesday night. And literally, it is this gorgeous piece of artwork. He did it in collaboration with, um, I apologize if I say this wrong, but Hajime Soriyama for his new helmet. This is the same designer that helped him create his brand, the Plus 44 World, the t-shirts that he did with his baby pictures and all that. And the design is, like, very futuristic, so... It, just imagine like if you're watching Tron Legacy or Daft Punk performing, it's like the same vibe of that. It's almost like this silver plated look on it design. And honestly, it came out absolutely gorgeous. And, you know, respect because a lot of these drivers treat this like art. And I think this one, it would be taking first place at an art show. But I'm really happy that the drivers took it so serious this week. Like these are some badass helmets excuse my language and to close us off i'm gonna actually be passing this on to ito who has us with a very fun pre outro to give us a little flashback friday i mean i mentioned 2019 before and the chaos it brought but there's more courtesy of mclaren's and lando norris when he was trying asian cuisine for a video he literally said as to being asked to try sushi, basically. But it's near a fish. And if you want the context, why he said that, go check out the video. It's on YouTube. And honestly, him saying, it's, but it's near a fish, is peak Lando for me. So that's why I could not not include it. What do you predict will win the race this weekend? Let us know on our socials. Everywhere we are Paddock Girls Podcast, except on Twitter, where you can find us at Paddock Girls Pod. As always, don't forget to rate, review, and share the podcast wherever you listen from, like Apple, Spotify, and now even on TikTok. Thank you so much for joining us in the paddock today. We'll see you after the race. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig. Goodbye, Craig.